Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Gain Back Your Velocity When Working with Kubernetes with Lucas, co-founder and CEO of Loft Labs. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining from the world. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You can put your questions in the chat window in LinkedIn, and we will get to that uh, mostly in the end, but also we will pop some questions in uh, in the middle. Uh, and I'll be your host, Rahul. I head the growth marketing here at Loft, and I'll be in the background moderating the questions. So now uh, over to you, Lucas. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the introduction, uh, Rahul. Uh, let's get this uh, session started. I uh, prepared a couple of slides. Um, as Raul mentioned, I'm Lucas, uh, the CEO of Loft Labs. Um, we're working on a whole bunch of open source Kubernetes tools, including vCluster, uh, DevSpace, and a couple of other projects that we're involved with. And, you know, velocity, uh, developer experience, those are really important things uh, in, you know, pretty much anyone's uh, journey who has to deal with code uh, day to day. So, you know, looking at Kubernetes, everybody's like, you know, Kubernetes is complex. Kubernetes uh, may actually slow you down. So uh, how can we, you know, kind of get back to this very, very efficient workflow that we had pre-Kubernetes? Um, that's essentially what today's session uh, is about. Um, to essentially go back a few years, you know, let's, let's you know, take a journey back down uh, memory lane. Um, a few years ago, the world was a lot simpler, right? Um, Every you know tech startup that was created like 10, 15 years ago, you know whether that was GitLab, GitHub, uh, a lot of companies uh, you know essentially bet on Ruby on Rails and they were super happy with their stack, right? Um, because it was super efficient, it was easy for engineers to get up and running. And velocity is really key uh, in business, um, and then you know also obviously in tech to you know create business value. Um, back then, it was super straightforward. We essentially fired up a Rails server with uh, two words, right? <laughs> it's like super straightforward uh, starting this Rails server on our local machine. Um, and then if you wanted to deploy that, we essentially just did a git push uh, Heroku main, I guess, these days, Heroku uh, master back then, um, to deploy a uh, branch. Um, and then uh, essentially, we ran the command Heroku open to get a URL to access uh, things in the browser, be able to test it, right? write some local scripts to test against our you know, REST API or whatever we were building. Um, things were a lot, lot simpler back then. And then a few years later, uh, uh, you know, complexity uh, increased in terms of you know, people were serving global audiences, you know, cloud became a thing, distributed computing uh, uh, you know, essentially emerged uh, for, for the masses. And you know, then suddenly, you know, monolith uh was not the great option anymore right they really sucked right uh and everybody was like we need microservices we need kubernetes right kubernetes started um to uh emerge and you know every every tech startup uh started in in that cycle uh essentially saw the issues of the of the uh, monolith and why they were betting on on a different technology um monolithic applications uh have a couple of uh issues they're very tightly coupled. Um, so if you have a Ruby application and you start out as a small startup, that's an, that's great, right? Velocity is amazing. We can ship this pretty quickly. We can build new features and actually get that app out the door. But um, down the road, we're going to have like so many different um, use cases. The platform that we're building is expanding. And ultimately, this tight coupling uh, turns into dependency hell, right? Because suddenly, we have to have you know ten people involved to figure out can we ship this new feature or will that break something else somewhere down the road um, in in our monolith and and that's pretty problematic. So ultimately, um, you know we we're, we have a very very centralized application with a monolith. Uh, that means we have uh, stability concerns in terms of if we're upgrading something, if we're changing something. Um, does that affect something else, right? Uh, let's just think about, you know, infamous like database migrations uh, that were underestimated and are super hard to roll back and uh, effectively brought down entire, uh, you know, um, internet services that, that, you know, thousands or even millions of people uh, were using. 
Uh, so that that's really problematic. And then you have things like uh, upgrades become very, very complicated, and that really slows down your release cycles. And that's really not what we want. So, you know, I guess we need microservices in Kubernetes, right? So everybody was kind of like, you know, moving uh, on on the new hype train of like segmenting uh, Monolith into uh, different, um, you know, microservices, shipping them in containers, uh, using tools like Docker and Kubernetes um, to to orchestrate uh, our our microservices in the cloud. In that solves a lot of these concerns, but it introduces new concerns because microservices and Kubernetes may really slow you down. And a lot of engineers actually are facing this right now. Um, and so we're talking about it in this session because when we're thinking about our previous you know, Rails application, it was really like Rails server to start it up, Heroku push to essentially instantiate it, right? Heroku open to get a URL. If we're thinking about the same workflow with containers today, if we do it in uh, step by step, it's essentially we have to build and tag images. You know, this command alone is a lot longer than a Rails server, right? And it's just building and tagging an image. It doesn't do uh, much more. And we have to push an image to a registry, right? Uh, the part I didn't include here is like, how do I even get the credentials for that registry? Where does that registry live? What is our tagging strategy? How do images get cleaned up again, right? Whoa, there's a whole bunch of complexity uh, on that end. Then we got to deploy. Look at this bulky command, right? <laughs> Use two lines of um, of code here in, in the slides uh, for this because, yeah, we got to you know use Helm, use customize, uh, plain manifests. I'm you know sparing you the whole uh, wall of YAML here, but uh, that's essentially living under the hood here as well. In uh, that's not very very simple. And then if we want to now expose an application, access that application, or well, the first step to doing anything, seeing the logs, uh, opening in a browser, port forwarding, et cetera, is like finding the pod name, right? Because Kubernetes is distributed, so we don't really know, like there's no fixed name, right? Our application is not called API server or something like that, right? Our pod has some kind of suffix um, to it. So we got to find that, then copy it, then run a command like kubectl port forward, and uh, well, guess what? If we want to make a change, right, we have to start at the top again, right? And we can't skip skip any of these steps because well, we do need a new image. We need to push that new image. We need a Helm upgrade again to to upgrade this. Um, and then we need to find the part name again because the part name will have changed because um, Kubernetes will not recycle uh, the name of of this part. In, then we start our port forwarding again to this new part that has been creating Kubernetes. So that's not very, very fast and efficient, right? This is not our Heroku push and you know it's accessible for us. Um, so when people see workflows like this, uh, in the past couple of years, uh, there has been a new trend emerging, which is actually an old trend. And that is to reply to complexity with, we need to pass. <laughs> because pass that was Heroku, right? That was my first example uh, earlier in in these slides. Um, but it's a repeating pattern, and we're going to go into why this pattern will not be the ultimate solution in a second. But let's just take a look at at the history of pass um, because it's very very interesting. While creating this presentation, I was actually surprised that there's a very very static cycle of uh, passes being created after certain complexities have been introduced and then passes always see it seems like the solution right um so in 2007 uh you know we had heroku we had google's app engine uh emerge so that was like the og uh pass essentially being being created uh heroku is still the gold standard for a uh, successful pass today um but then again like a couple of years later, there was another wave of pass with uh, AWS uh, jumping on the hype train, uh, Cloud Foundry being created for the new you know, cloud uh, world uh, to essentially pro easily provision uh, clouds and large enterprises. Um, and then there was the whole like Docker container ecosystem happening, uh, Tutum, and then Dot Cloud, which ultimately kind of turned into Docker. Um, those uh, passes you know, came a couple of years later. And today, you know, uh, we have, we're seeing passes emerge based on Kubernetes to kind of solve the complexities, you know, not of containers, not of cloud, but of Kubernetes now. Uh, so we have things like Google Cloud Run, uh, which try to be that pass layer on top. And there's a whole bunch of others. The Rancher founders uh, just started 
uh, company to build a build a pass on Kubernetes. There's a whole, you know, whole stream of of companies, open source developers focused on building this this new pass. Um, so why is this pattern repeating uh, every four years or so? Why is everybody thinking, well, we need a pass for this, right? We need to layer this. Um, it's very, very, very interesting. Um, and I think what we always see after a few years into the past journey is people start hating their past. <laughs> and it's interesting that that, that, that repeats because uh, I think passes have a couple of benefits and you know being opinionated actually is a huge benefit. Um, but by being opinionated, uh, a pass also really limits uh, a user's choices. And that may be problematic because, uh, you know, if Heroku doesn't support that database that you need, right? Uh, so, you know, they have a MySQL available, right? But you need something else. You need a time series database. Well, you know, then you're quickly hitting the limits of, of what your pass can do for you. Um, pass is also a lot of magic, which uh, obviously solves a lot of problems initially because you know, the magic does things under the hood. So you don't have to, you know, invent them, think about them, configure them, right? Um, and that's great. Uh, but having uh, magic also really obstructs uh, debugging. It really hinders the user to dive deeper because um, we're essentially just seeing that pass layer, right? We can't really dig a lot deeper with Heroku. We don't know what's happening under the hood. And that really, uh, you know, impacts the capabilities of an engineer to, um, you know, debug things and, and dive deeper into uh, what is actually what may be going wrong, right? How to optimize certain things. Uh, those those things are very very limited. And then, you know, pass ultimately means abstractions. Uh, it's layers of abstractions. Each each pass adds adds a adds a layer essentially, um, and that creates kind of a lock in, right? It may just be, you know, in the case of Cloud Foundry, it may be open source lock-in. In the case of Heroku, it may be a lock-in into a SaaS platform. But ultimately, it's a lock-in into the way of doing things. And then once you actually get to the point where, you know, that magic, magic and the, the fact that the past is so opinionated and limiting you in certain ways, that lock-in becomes problematic, you know, even if it's an open source lock-in. Um, it is often problematic to have that lock-in uh, because you're doing things a certain way and, you know, you're really um, bound by the ways of, of your past. So how can we solve this nevertheless, right? Kubernetes is complicated. Uh, everyone from beginners to experts uh, sees that. How can we actually get around, um, you know, Kubernetes being so complicated? That is still an open question, right? Um, Kubernetes has endless choices uh, in its ecosystem. And that's really, really great because, you know, like look at the CNCF landscape, right? I'm sparing you that image that you see in every second talk, but there's like thousands of tools on there uh, being created in the open source space. Um, and that creates two things. Uh, it's, it's very exciting because, you know, you want to try all these tools and you have a lot of uh, possibilities. That sounds very great. But it also leads to uh, two things. And the first term is actually, that was new to me by while creating this, this talk, is uh, the cytophobia, right? So the fear of making a decision. So you're looking at like, oh, should I use Solo or should I use uh, Istio or Linkerd, right? What am I, what am I using uh, for, for a certain, um, you know, what am I using for my service mesh or what am I using for my API gateway, right? You're looking at all of these tools and you're like, um, which one are we picking, right? We want to bet on the winning horse, but which one is it, right? Um, so you're kind of holding off because you're not going all in into one because you you don't you're not sure yet which one is gonna you know get the broad community adoption and get the twenty thousand stars on GitHub, right? Um, so you hold off on making that decision, and that's actually really problematic for a business because um, we can you know, just stand still. We got to move forward. We got to ship new features. We got to certify customer requests. Um, so the cytophobia is really a blocker uh, in tech when you have so many choices and you don't make um, just a decision. And in a lot of cases, it's actually pretty ironic that it doesn't matter which decision you make. Uh, later on, you can always refactor things and you can always switch things over to, to a different tech stack. You know, I know so many companies that bet on... Uh, you know, Docker Swarm and, and Mesosphere, 
in in the early days and then you know kubernetes won and well they just had to make a make a change towards kubernetes spotify gave an interesting talk about this at, at kubecon i think in uh what was it two three three years ago um about them building their own orchestrator internally and releasing it the same day as kubernetes was, was publicly announced and that was super unfortunate right but they still went with their technology for a few years because it just worked for them and at some point they realized okay kubernetes because it's open source because it has so much backing in the community is actually outpacing what we can deliver internally and then they made the switch to kubernetes and sure that was probably painful and there was probably uh, a lot of work that went into you know switching from their helios platform which was their internal tool to um to kubernetes but ultimately that was possible right and that's a very fundamental change they made from like you know the container orchestrator platform uh to to another one um but those things are possible so you know uh, ultimately just making a call is is better than not making a call right you've got to decide uh, with something but there's also another effect of of so many choices in kubernetes and that's fomo right you're like oh there's this new tool i gotta check it out right uh oh there's this new option right we gotta jump on this hype train right you have this fear of missing out on on things when these new hypes emerge um and that's another thing that really is very very common in kubernetes space um kubernetes is also perceived as very complicated because it's very explicit and i see that as a benefit because uh it is you know kubernetes is not a lot of magic so it's always clear what hap what's happening right and there's always some kind of yaml option to tweak whatever you need to uh tweak for your specific scenario or use case um but it leads to yaml hell very very clearly right everybody knows this um that explicitness right we got to state everything so um that actually uh you know leads to you know complicated yaml manifests and you know really overloads people a little bit um and then you know kubernetes is ultimately very composable right there is not just like it's not like a rails monolith that says like oh, we'll deal with all of this for you um it essentially lets you pick and choose for everything right so you pick your storage you pick your networking you pick your service mesh you pick your api gateway right like all of these different things um you're not really bound by the framework or the specific paths you 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 have a lot of flexibility, but that also leads to complexity because you have to decide how are these things working together. So when you're making these choices in when you're explicitly defining uh, what should be running, you kind of need to wire things up in the right way to actually, you know, seamlessly work together. And there are very few tools that help you, um, you know, integrate things very, very smoothly in the Kubernetes world. So there's some leg work to do on, on, on that end for sure. Um, when we're thinking about, so how can we alleviate some of the pains here? How can we actually make Kubernetes uh, a lot more approachable for engineers so that they don't face all of this, right? A lot of companies have started doing platform engineering, right? A lot of uh, teams uh, within companies are concerned with things like developer velocity, developer experience now in their building tooling for their internal teams um, to essentially have this like golden path uh that that teams can can use to uh get a great experience and build build features very very quickly and and if you ask me the 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 biggest thing for these teams is that they should be looking at how can we build transparent abstraction rather than passes right um because you can build some kind of internal pass or you can build on top of things like cloud run but ultimately, you're locking your users in again into something. If you're asking uh, me, I would actually argue transparent abstractions is what, what a lot of companies are looking for. Um, and in my opinion, that means we're building something that is client only. So we're not building this, you know, bulky pass that we're sending requests to and it somehow handles uh, stuff for us magically under the hood building something client only that is based on kubectl we're building something cli first so engineers can use it in their terminal uh, from their vs code right or whatever uh, ide they may prefer um and we need to make sure that whatever we're building on that end is customizable uh is extensible because ultimately every company every team every project within a company is different and 
it just whatever we're doing it needs to have that flexibility for for folks uh to essentially build out their specific use case and i think one big benefit we have in the kubernetes world is we have the kubernetes api and that's actually the huge huge benefit of kubernetes it standardizes the way on how to define things right with this explicit yaml language uh or json actually under the hood being kind of pushed back and forth uh between kubectl and in the in the kubernetes api server and as long as we stick to that as long as we're building something for our engineers that streamlines their workflow but essentially ties back to a kubectl command right if i'm able to run these commands uh via kubectl instead of the cli that's a transparent abstraction it means that I can use the tool to streamline certain things because it, you know, it just combines certain commands, it executes them in a certain order, it finds the right way to execute them, but I can literally tell the tool, and it's even better if the tool can explain it to me. Uh, please tell me how does this command, uh, you know, what's the equivalent in kubectl or Helm or you know, any other higher level tool based on Kubernetes? So I can essentially say, well. If you run this command, it under the hood runs these five commands for you. And that's really smart because it makes things understandable for engineers, especially when they want to debug things, when they want to dive deeper. Uh, so we're not hitting that pass limitation of like, oh, now we're stuck, right? Now we're stuck with our pass and we can't get past that. Uh, that's essentially what we're preventing by betting on the Kubernetes API. And luckily, and that's... Uh, you know, towards the end of the slides and more towards the practical part of, of, of this webinar is um, there are actually tools out there. Uh, if you're asking me what is the best tool, uh, I would say that's probably the wrong question to ask, right? Because <laughs> it really depends on uh, what you're looking for and uh, the requirements you have for a specific uh, project, team, engineer, culture, right? There's so many factors to consider, so I can't give you, you know, a single answer to this but I can give you a couple of suggestions here um, in tools in, to look into. Uh, CNCF always is a great starting point. There are two projects in the CNCF uh, sandbox right now that you may want to consider. Telepresence, they've been in the sandbox for years. Um, they have the approach of, hey, you deploy your services, you know, how will you deploy them? We don't really cover that piece, right? We don't do image building, we don't do Helm install, right? Like none of these things are covered. Um, but we're essentially deploying things. Uh, uh, but after it's deployed, we're helping you uh, now connect your local host dev environment to your remote uh, deployed services so that you can run one service locally and then the other microservices run inside the Kubernetes cluster and they do some network magic to essentially say, hey, your local service is now connecting with these remote services. Um, it's a very, very interesting tool. Very was a very early tool in the Kubernetes development world. Uh, and then DevSpace, that's actually one of our tools. We've been building uh, DevSpace for a couple of years now and now uh, put it in sandbox in, in the CNCF. And so I'm super excited to kind of list it here uh, next to uh, an amazing tool like Telepresence. Um, DevSpace takes a little bit of different stands as Telepresence. It has a broader scope. So it also covers things like how do we deploy this application? If you want to, you can obviously tell DevSpace not to take care of that. But if you wanted to cover things like efficient image building um, and then uh, you know tagging, pushing optionally as well, um, including you know Helm install, customizations. However, we're standing up our 20 microservices, DevSpace can cover that, even dependencies across Git repositories. And then it introduces, unlike Telepresence, it doesn't let you run a service locally on your laptop. Instead, it runs everything inside a Kubernetes cluster. But the services that you have an IDE window open for on your local machine that you're working with, they get hot reloaded. That means without having to image build, you actually can update the container in real time. And that introduces a whole lot of velocity because these commands I showed you earlier, you know, image building, pushing, tagging, et cetera, that takes a lot of time. Uh, with DevSpace, we're just entirely skipping that. We're deploying the prod version of everything and then we're hot swapping things inside these containers. We're switching out binaries, we're switching out source code, we're still switching out static assets um, via, via a sync mechanism, and then essentially hot reload these containers uh, really, really immediately up on any changes you make on your local file system. And then we do things like port forwarding in the background. We let you hook up your IDE via um, you know, uh, remote 
extension, for example, VS Code's remote extension is pretty awesome. So you can connect to these dev environments if you want to. Uh, you can use uh, remote debuggers with them. You know, DevSpace supports all of these all of these different things to really let you build that perfect developer experience for uh, for your team. And then there's a broader ecosystem of tools that I would encourage you to look into uh, as well. Scaffold, Tilt, Octetor, Garden. Those are just a couple of tools uh, outside of the CNCF projects that I would strongly urge you to uh, have a look at. There's like 50 other tools here as well. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of <laughs> space on the slides. So I can't list all of them, but definitely have a look at, um, you know, I think the section is called app definition um, and, and microservice building, I think, on the CNCF landscape where you can see, you know, different other tools uh, in this space. And uh, yeah, that's essentially the 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 end of my slides over here. Um, Ro, do you want to, me to dive right into a demo or I'll pull in some questions beforehand? Uh, we can we can get into the demo, and I will pull up okay. some questions in the meantime. All right, perfect. Then let me um, let me close this. So. I'm going to show you how DevSpace works just very briefly, uh, walk you through the, you know, getting started and show a couple of examples of what you can do with it. Um, and uh, we're going, you know, just through our quick start guide. Of course, I already, you know, downloaded DevSpace. I have it on my local machine. You can install it via NPM, Yarn, Brew, uh, just download the binaries. It's, it's a client only binary tool. So you can literally, you know, curl. Uh, this on your on your local machine, put it in your path, and it's up and running. It's client only, CLI only. The only thing you need is a valid, um, you know, kube config, kube context, so you actually have a Kubernetes cluster to develop against. And that can be an EKS, uh, an AWS in the cloud, right? It can be your private cloud, can be your home lab, it can be Docker desktop, right? It can be Minikube, uh, whatever Kubernetes cluster you have available. And we also create that portability for teams. Because we know teams use different Kubernetes clusters. They may be Kubernetes experts that you know have a different setup than beginners who just download uh, Docker Desktop, for example. In this case, I just download Docker Desktop to to demonstrate this. We need a project to work with. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to go with this Node.js example. But there's also one for GoLang, Ruby, etc. Right? There's so many different languages uh, that DevSpace work with, and obviously you can bring your own project uh, to develop it with DevSpace. Um, so if I open up VS Code here, um, first thing for me is to retrieve this quick start uh, project. Let's have a quick look into this. It's a very, very simple project. We have an index.js file here, which essentially just uh, yeah spits out some HTML. Uh, that's all it does on a specific route, on a specific port, right? Uh, and then we have some HTML code, and we're starting. Uh, our server here on this port. That's all we're doing. Very, very simple. One file uh, JavaScript application. Obviously, we have a package JSON. Uh, this is an express uh, you know, web server. But again, this could be very, anything else, right? Um, and then we have Nodemon to kind of do like even hot reloading in the container to make it, uh, make it even faster. Um, but essentially, this has nothing to do with DevSpace, right? This is just some JavaScript project. And what we need to do now is uh, we need to initialize this project for DevSpace. Um, the way to do this is with the command DevSpace in it. But you can also find examples in our you know, Git repositories. Um, but this is kind of a guided setup process, right? So it first looks at the programming language. It saw a couple of JavaScript files. So it says, like, hey, this is a JavaScript project or a different language. We just confirmed this is JavaScript. It's going to ask us how we want to deploy this project. And now we're getting started. It actually recommends to use Helm. Um, but we can also go with plain manifests of customize, right? I'm just going to go with Helm right now because it's one of the most popular deployment tools. And then it detected, oh, this is actually a quick start guide. So I don't need to ask you 20 more questions. I'm going to condense it down to one or two if you, uh, you know, answer yes here. So we'll say yes in this case to save some time. And um, yeah, we have the question uh, here. Uh, is this just for deploying the project, or do we actually want to pop reload and develop it? In this case, we're saying, yes, we have the source code in this repo. We want to develop it. Uh, the Docker file is here. It already detected that, so it's suggesting that. We can also tell it use a different Docker file, use an alternative build tool like uh, Bazel, for example. In this, cool, in this case, we'll just go with the recommended Docker file here. Um, it's showing us, hey, do you want to use the GitHub image registry, another registry? Do you want to skip registry entirely uh, without image pushing? 
because as I said, we have that hot reloading mechanism anyway. Uh, it also detected I'm signed in with Docker Hub, so it's suggesting that right away. Um, I'm just going to select this over here. It's going to check my credentials real quick. And then it creates this file here uh, called DevSpace YAML. And the DevSpace YAML essentially codifies uh, how this project or any project would be uh, developed, right? So we see uh, this is a version file, so we can have different versions of DevSpace YAML and different Git repositories. That's so it's going to internally migrate these things. Um, we also see down here that our IDE detected uh, that this is a DevSpace YAML file uh, because we have the JSON schema uh, published, uh, which is very nice because you get uh, you know autocomplete here uh, for this YAML immediately. Uh, you don't really have to install an extension or whatever. It works out of the box to autocomplete things. We see pipelines here, which are going to tell us what happens when you start a development mode, what happens if you just want to deploy things. It specifies where our images should go if we used if we wanted to do image building, how we deploy, for example, with Helm in this case, and then how the development uh, should be done with this project. Um, to develop a project like this, the first thing um, we need is Kubernetes cluster, right? I said I'm using um, Docker Desktop right now and their Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we can actually um, check that here. Yeah, we see this is quite old, this, this uh, Docker Desktop cluster. If we want to have a fresh cluster uh, that we just use as a throwaway cluster, right? Uh, we can also use one of our other open source projects called a uh, vCluster, which creates a virtual cluster inside a Kubernetes cluster. Great thing about this is you essentially um, you know, have the capability, although you have this one Kubernetes cluster with Docker Desktop that it provides, you can now create several virtual Kubernetes clusters for different projects, trying out different things, right? And they don't affect each other. Anyone who's ever broken a Minikube cluster or a Docker Desktop cluster uh, knows that it takes like 10 minutes to reset this and it's like very annoying because everything's gone, right? Um, because you messed something up, right? Some finalizer was said, and you don't know why this namespace is not terminating. Right? <laughs> All of these issues can happen in Kubernetes. Um, so instead, we can just run a virtual cluster um, with our vCluster CLI. I'm going to call that VC1. Um, and that's essentially deploying this virtual cluster for me. And then it's connecting me to this virtual cluster with a kube contact that points into this virtual cluster. And then inside that virtual cluster, we can now use DevSpace to develop. Again, we can also skip the virtual cluster part entirely and just work directly inside the Docker desktop cluster. But with our new um, new virtual cluster, you can see here, you know, our namespaces are all like 16 seconds ago because we just spun up this virtual cluster. And we have a fresh cluster now, right? No matter what happened in Docker desktop beforehand, we have a fresh empty Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and we can run DevSpace Dev in this cluster. DevSpace Dev is the core command. Oh, it's actually asking us, do you want to use the default namespace? Uh, we recommend not to do that um, because uh, you know you can't delete it in Kubernetes, so it's much easier. Although you can create uh, and delete the virtual cluster very quickly, uh, you may still want to keep that virtual cluster around. So I'm just going to answer no here and use dev space, use namespace, and then we call it just dev, right? Which creates a new namespace called dev. And now we can run dev space dev going to this dev namespace instead of the default namespace. And you can already see where the user experience, dev space has a lot of these best practices in there. Like it, it's seeing, oh, using default namespace, you actually want to use it. It may not be a best practice, um, but it also leaves you the option to still do that, right? And it's all just kubectl commands under the hood, right? So this took uh, maybe 10 seconds or so, and we're inside a container now. Instead of being on our local machine, you know, these files are still on our local machine, right? This DevSpace YAML is on a local machine, but our terminal down here is inside the remote container. In, let me see if I can actually show the processes in here. We see there's some syncing going on, there's some tunneling going on, some SSH forwarding going on. Um, that's what DevSpace does in the background. But we're also seeing that the PID1 is asleep. So although our container would contain the production version of the service, right, it wouldn't fire up that production version because you want to develop the service. What it does instead is start the sleep mode. So we can now start the service ourselves. So we can run npm start here to actually fire up the application. 
And what that does, it automatically opens the browser as well, right? We see, hey, it's time to code, right? Just our HTML that was created. And we can see here, now it's time to code. And if I go into my IDE and into this JavaScript file, I can now make changes here, right? We see, for example, example app listening on, and then uh, listening right now on, right? And I can say the line that we saw earlier, now it's time to code with dev space, right? And as soon as I save this file, you see down here, the application reloaded. And we can see our changes, right? Listening right now is what we changed. We can go to the browser, we can reload here, and we can see time to code with dev space, right? All these things that we just changed in that file take effect immediately. And that's because this container was not running PID1 NPM start, it was running sleep and we manually started NPM. That means we can also you know, go out of here, add our package JSON, and then run commands like NPM install, right? add new dependencies, et cetera. So we're moving essentially our entire you know, execution engine into the container. Our runtime is the container now instead of our local machine, but we can still edit and work on our local um, you know, VS code which really boosts productivity because let's say you have 20 microservices and you want to debug communication between three of them, right? You may not even be able to run 20 microservices locally, right? And you may have difficulties spinning up each one individually. It's really hard to know how to do all of this for each one of them. Here, it's as easy as running one DevSpace dev. DevSpace will stand up not just the current project, but also all of its dependencies. So all the other Git repositories you may need. And it does that in seconds. And then if I want to develop two services, I open two VS Code uh, windows and run DevSpace dev there. And then DevSpace does a hot reloading mechanism for these two particular microservices. And now I can debug them, right? See the communication, see the logs in real time, have control here, add dependencies if I need to, and really get this like hot reloading workflow um, for all of my new containers that I want to work with. Um, that's essentially uh, how, how DevSpace works. Uh, but again, there's a whole bunch of other things you can discover in DevSpace, um, oops, including commands like, uh, you know, there's shortcut commands. Like if I want to, for example, you know, run kubectl exec, right? I need to run kubectl get parts first, copy the part name, et cetera. DevSpace has a shortcut for that. This essentially has um, the command DevSpace enter, which is our exec, right? and it immediately drops it into container, or if there are multiple parts in that namespace, it would essentially ask you, please select one of the containers, and it has a really nice uh, selector where I can use a keyboard up and down keys to select which container I want to use. Um, and then again, as soon as I'm done working, um, I can exit out of there, um, and you know, this may be running in the in an EKS cluster or so, so I can now turn my virtual cluster off by running the cluster pause, uh, and pausing the virtual cluster, um, uh, or I can run uh, the cluster uh, delete to entirely wipe the virtual cluster and then use a blank new one next time. And again, I can have five sleeping ones in the background um, and I can work with three virtual clusters in parallel. So that combination of dev space and the cluster is also very, very powerful uh, to, to boost developer velocity. All right, that's pretty much the end uh, of um, of this demo. Uh, I think we're already running a little bit over time, Raul. Uh, but do we still have time for for questions or no? Uh, yes, we can pull up this question. Uh, where's the difference between a pass? Yeah, right here. Got it. Um, there's a difference between a pass with a lot of config options and your transparent abstraction for you. Uh, wouldn't transparently adding a list of different components to your Kubernetes lead to some more config overload for the engineers? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think the, the big difference, um, I think, between what I call transparent abstraction and a pass is that I can go deeper, right? So if, for example, DevSpace would not support port forwarding, right? This here still deploys to Kubernetes. This here still creates a pod, right? 
So if I'm actually using my vCluster again, and again, I can connect to that, I think with vCluster connect vc1 or vCluster create vc1 again, um, we can see that there's a pod in a Kubernetes cluster. I can run kubectl get pod, and I can run kubectl kub uh, forward, uh, port forward, sorry. Um, that means I can do these things um, even if the pass doesn't support it, right? Versus the, the classical pass doesn't allow you to do that. The classical pass does not allow you to work with, you know, what is with the VM under the pass, right? You can't do that usually. But what you can do with a transparent abstraction is you can access the underlying Kubernetes cluster because it's based on the Kubernetes API. It's client only. There's no server as an intermediary translating something, right? It's essentially just in the CLI. So dev space dev command can be translated probably to like 30 different kubectl commands. And if I need to run two or three more, I can do that because dev space and kubectl are using the same kube context. They're talking to the same Kubernetes API. That's what I mean with transparent abstraction. It's essentially build on that, on that common API uh, rather than building some you know, proprietary or even open source REST API or GraphQL API on top of it. It doesn't really need to do that. Um, that's why I would also argue it's so important to be client only for, for building successful tooling in the Kubernetes space. And again, a lot of the tools that you see in the space are actually following that pattern. It's very, very interesting that a lot of uh, you know different engineering teams apparently see uh, that this should be the, the way forward. All right, I know we are uh, just over time a little bit, but Lucas, can you um, talk a little bit about um, the CI CD use case and maybe any kind of integrations and how they work with dev space? Just a quick thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of teams are essentially uh, starting their journey either in CI or in dev when they start using dev space. So they pick either one of these two use cases, but because they're so close to each other and dev space essentially works for both of them, they start using the other use case as well, right? So I may be picking dev space for uh, the development use case. And then three months down the line, I see like, okay, I got like 50 happy developers. There's like a hundred other developers who are still uh, on the path to adopting it. Uh, but we also have some struggle in CI, right? And we kind of want to standardize things, uh, CI and development. We want to essentially have this, you know, we really, what we do with dev space is give developers a production-like environment without having them, you know, by codifying everything into this dev space YAML file, we essentially have a declarative definition of what a great workflow should look like for developing this, right? Um, so we can also specify a great workflow for, how to run integration tests with this, right? And um, how to spin up an environment that you can run end-to-end -end tests against, right? And it makes a ton of sense to start with one of these use cases instead of you know starting with like two or three uh, all at once. But if you are, you know, if the I is what what is your biggest issue right now, start with that use case. If dev is your biggest issue, start with that one, and then you'll see that there is so much value in expanding dev space to the other use cases as well, because you're maintaining the same kind of principles and the same dev space YAML. There's a lot of reusability possible. Um, that dev space uh, is really used by a lot of teams for multiple of these uh, of these use cases. And CI is super interesting. You essentially run something like um, you know vCluster create to spin up a virtual cluster. Again, like if you have like fifty different you know branches in your in your Git repository and so many different microservices, right? Do you really want to create a different Kubernetes cluster for each one of these? You probably can't because it takes like thirty minutes to create a virtual uh, a Kubernetes cluster inside EKS, for example. You can obviously use namespaces, but not every application can be contained in a namespace. Someone can bring an entire cluster down if they're running in a namespace. So why not create a virtual cluster, right? You run vCluster create inside your CI pipeline, and then you run things like dev space deploy, and then you run a command like dev space run end-to-end -end tests, right? And then you have a three-line, uh, you know, essentially CI pipeline that runs end-to-end -end tests. And, you know, you add two more lines and you get preview environments for each request, right? 
And it becomes very, very easy to, to set these things up for, for great experience in CI as well. Um, I definitely think that's super, super interesting. And with the hot reloading in development, you're also preventing that people abuse the CI as a, you know, a lot of people can't run 20 microservices locally anymore. They need data from some kind of cloud bucket, right? So what they end up doing today is essentially, you know, pushing to Git all the time because they want to see do things still run there, does it still work there? Um, and instead, what you can do is you can have preview environments created, end-to-end uh, -end environments created, et cetera, and then they can connect to these environments via dev space and debug them right in there instead of having to do a new Git push again, right? Because every time you run your pipeline, it's going to create a new image. It's going to take forever, right? It's much better to say, hey, this integration test failed. We're not immediately cleaning this environment up. We may just pause that virtual cluster to save resources. But then the developer sees that, that integration test has failed. I can use dev space dev, right? I run a command to retrieve the, retrieve the kube context to this environment, run a command to run dev space dev, and I can see what's not working here and debug it right there in that failed CI environment. And that's such a better experience than you know, pushing over and over and like, oh, it works on my machine, but it doesn't work in CI, why not? Right? <laughs> and, um, it's so much easier to just hook yourself into that CI environment that it makes a ton of sense using DevSpace for both of these use cases, ultimately. That's super helpful. Thank you, Lucas. All right, I think we are at time, so we can uh, wrap it up. So thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Please follow us on LinkedIn and we have a, uh, an exciting webinar um, next month coming up. It's with one of our customers and you will get to see like how they are actually using to scale their workflows in engineering. So you can sign up for that. You can see this QR code and we will also post it on LinkedIn. Uh, we will send you the recording uh, afterwards. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lucas, for an uh, insightful presentation. Yeah, thanks, everyone.